This is Channel 4, the Mabinogi. In the spring of 1983, preparations began for a unique theatrical event. That summer, over 10,000 people in Wales would flock to see a spectacular open-air performance. A new telling of the oldest tales known to Britain, the ancient Celtic stories called the Mabinoki. The daunting task of staging this epic three-hour production was taken on by Jeff Moore's Moving Being, a theatre company with an exciting history of experimental work. The company has developed an original theatrical style which integrates actors and dancers, music and visual images. The demands of outdoor performance are rigorous, both physically and vocally. For the Mabinogi, the company will be involved in acrobatics, horse riding, hawk handling, and all manner of stunts. A cast of over 50 were brought together from all over Wales for this bilingual production. Welsh-speaking actors and singers joined Moving Being to convey the essence of these bardic tales in their native tongue. And the next thing to do, of course, is learn the whistle part. Music was specially commissioned from Robin Williamson, formerly of the Incredible String Band, a Scotsman who came to Wales to create a musical score out of the whole company and his own innovative mixture of traditional and modern instruments. The Mabinogi was written down sometime in the 11th century, but the subject of its story stems from far earlier, from the Celtic world, hundreds of years before Christ, expressed in myth and magic, legend and early history. The production is anchored by a group of storytellers, basing it firmly in the oral tradition from which it comes. The storytellers introduce and interpret the action as these ancient and often mysterious characters are brought to life. Rehearsals for the Mabinogi took place in South Wales, at St Stephen's, a converted church in Cardiff's Dockland, which is Moving Beings home. Much of the scope and scale of the event, however, will have to wait until the company moves up to North Wales, where the production is to be staged in the magnificent environment of Carnarvon Castle. With its Eisteddfod background, there's a strong amateur tradition in Wales. Arms up, arms up, arms up, arms up. A lively patchwork of children and young people working on weekends and in the school holidays provided the Mabinoki with a dynamic chorus. are over. The medieval theatre carts, which will feature much of the action, are dismantled and packed. And with a truckload of props and equipment, the company travels north. Carnarvon, activity is already well underway. Geraint Jarman, the most popular rock artist in Wales, will make such a powerful contribution to the proceedings, rehearses with his band. The technical crew have been building for a week. Designer Peter Mumford and a team of electricians, painters and craftspeople complete their preparations. Carnarvon Castle is one of Europe's finest medieval fortresses and incidentally makes an exciting natural amphitheater. But despite its theatrical advantages, staging the Mabinogi here highlighted a complex political problem. Like many of the castles in Wales, Carnarvon was built by Edward I to confirm his conquest of the country and his victory over Llewellyn, the last Welsh prince. As the subsequent site of the investiture, Carnarvon remains for some a symbol of English domination and its threat to the language and culture of Wales. 
the Mabinogi is one of the cornerstones of that culture, and Moving Beings Production set out to celebrate this neglected heritage by creating a popular event that would communicate to both Welsh and English audiences. For the first time in 200 years, horses entered the castle gates, trumpets sounded from the battlements, and the walls rang with the echoes of characters that sprang from this soil thousands of years ago. Arise, arise, follow me. Follow me, my measure down. On the Vendera de Bruyd Camreg are sanctai the wish. Beggars or kings, as it might be. Mad Hin Hannes and Sifru de Defroeto, Messer Abreuid in a Nassole night. See what might be, see what might have been. Here's rights, here's wrongs, here's reasons why. A time to live, a time. Kiro Kalon Huedla, you in Kiriad me, a dear the Vint Huyen Gelliminae, Balrodio, a downshire, my fervia on Fili will flam my tan. Novi, a flam, a parati, a dry, I am time. I am time. I'm Seru. I am time. The Mabinogi is composed of four stories known as the four branches of the Mabinogi. The first branch is entitled Pwyll, Prince of David. It concerns Pwyll's marriage to the magic queen Rhiannon, goddess of horses and birds, and the birth of their son Pryderi, the boy hero who is lost and found. But the story begins with Pwyll's encounters in the other world a territory common to the Celtic imagination, and one into which Pwyll strays by accident while out hunting, he is suddenly confronted by the red dogs of the other world. Having unwittingly insulted Aram, king of the other world, Hulk must atone. Here is how you will make compensation for this outrage. Hagdan, whose realm borders on mine, makes war on me continually. Deliver me from this oppression, and I will make peace with you. Here is how you will do it. You will go home in my place, and I will arrange it that no one will know the difference. A year from tonight, you will meet with my great enemy, Havgan. Slay him, but with a single blow. He will not survive that. However he may plead with you, do not strike him a second time. He agrees to change places with Aran for one year, and at the end of that time, to do combat with Aran's foe, Havgan. In the guise of King Aran, Pult spent his days with meat and drink and carousal. And his nights with the Queen. But 
once in bed, he would turn his back towards her. And from then until morning, not one word would he speak to her. And so the year passed until the time of the meeting with Havgan drew near. By the appointed night, the whole kingdom was aware of the tryst oh, and gathered oh, at the board oh, to witness the end. Oh, 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 oh. 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 <laughs> to my death. I have no claim against you and know of no reason for you to slay me. But for God's sake, since you have begun my death, now make an end. I may yet repent doing what I have done to you. Let he who wishes strike you again. I will not do so. Why do you not speak? I tell you, not so much as a word has been spoken in this place for a year now. How can that be? We've always had so much to speak of. Shame on me! If this place has seen pleasure or conversation between us this last year, or even your turning your face to me, let alone anything else. Lord God, what a faithful friend I have for a comrade. A lady, do not blame me. For I have neither lain down nor slept with you this last year. But how can this be? It was Puich, Prince of Doved, who came in my place a year ago last night. I swear to God, a strong pact you must have had with your friend for him to have restrained the temptations of the flesh and kept faith with you. Lady, those were my very thoughts. <laughs> One day, during a feast being held for him at Arber, Poich left the court and went to the top of a mound nearby, known as Gorsed Arber. It was said of this mound that whosoever sat upon it could not leave it without either receiving wounds or seeing a wonder. <laughs> tells Poich that she came to Narberth because she sought to see him. She is Rhiannon, the daughter of Heveth Hain, and is promised to her husband against her will. She tells him that she'll have no other and that for loving him, nor will she have another unless he rejects her. For his own part, Poich thinks Rhiannon the most beautiful woman he has ever seen and is determined to marry her. It is agreed that he should seek her out a year from that time at the court of her father, Heveth Hain.
joyous welcome was given to Puig by heaven, and all the resources of the court were laid at his disposal. In the midst of the feasting, a tall and noble youth approaches, looking for Puig. I will not be seated, for I am a mere supplicant and I have an errand. Well, speak freely. Lord, it is with you that my errand lies, for I have come to ask you a favor. Whatever you ask, so long as it's in my power to grant, you shall have it. What kind of an answer is that? My lady, he has given his answer, and in the presence of nobles. Friend, what is your request? The woman whom best I love is to be thy bride tonight. It is to ask for her the preparations and the feast that I have come. Tau, money dear. Need be gone, or you respect me suddenly, and now I give you a tea. What have I done? Never has a man made worse use of his wits than you have done. This is the man they want to give me to. Well, lady, I didn't know who he was. He is Gwal, son of Cleed, a rich and powerful nobleman. Since you've given your word, you cannot go back on it. You must now give me to him, or dishonor will befall you. I can never bring myself to do what you say. Give me to him. And I shall see to it that he will never have me. <laughs> How can that be? I shall give you a little bag which you must keep with you. I shall set a date a year from tonight for him to sleep with me. <laughs> At that time, you must come to the court, dressed in rags, and bring the bag to beg for food. I shall see to it that even if all the food in the land be placed in this bag, it can never be filled. <laughs> My lord, it is high time I had an answer to my request. You shall have as much of your request as is in my power to grant. A year from tonight, in this court, a feast shall be prepared for you, my friend. And you shall sleep with me. So Gwaul departed well satisfied. Poist returned to Doved, bearing with him the little magic sack which Rhiannon had given him and prepared to repay Gwaul's cunning with some trickery of his own. Ah, friends, and your sack has not been filled. <laughs> Between me and God, it will not be filled unless a true nobleman should tread down the food in a sack and cry, enough is enough. <laughs> And so it was that the game Badger in the Bag was first played. My lord, death in a bag is no proper end for me! You should listen to him. This is no proper end for a nobleman. <laughs> well then, I will deal with him according to your counsel. Here's my advice. You're now in a position where it will fall to you to satisfy many minstrels and supplicants. Let him, let him dispense these on your behalf. Lord, in your conditions, I will comply. Well, I will do what heaven and Rhiannon suggest. You forget. <clears throat> forget that gladly. And you now set a time for Rhiannon to follow you. Between me and God, we will leave together. If that is your will, Lord, Godspeed. They ate and drank and reveled till it came time to sleep when Poult and Rhiannon went to their chamber and the night was spent in pleasure and contentment. Pleasure and contentment, eh? In the third year of the reign of Poult and Rhiannon over David, heavy were the hearts of the men of the land that this man whom they loved as their lord and foster brother was still childless. But before the year was up, Rhiannon bore Poult a son in Arberth. Ar nos ei ganed, da gwyd gwragedd i wylio'r mab a'i fam. And the night he was born, three women were brought in to look after the boy. They kept their vigil for part of the night, but then, just before midnight...
boy is lost. Marma, lost? Lost? How? Lord God, where is he gone? I don't know, but it would be a small punishment to burn him. Or slay him because of this. I see we in a bead, I'll say help you. There is. I have good counsel. What is it? There is a staghound bitch that has just had pups. Let us kill one of them and smear Rhiannon's face and hands with the blood. We will swear that she herself has killed her son. Oh, venu, be thou a hononi. Stop! Yes, it will be her word against all three of us. For all her words, either in reason or with emotion, Rhiannon only got one answer from the women. You have no cause to ask me to put away my wife, save that she bear no children. I know that she has a child, and I will not part from her. But if she has done wrong, let her be punished for it. Rhiannon, for her part, consulted with teachers and men of wisdom. And when it seemed more fitting for her to accept penance than to haggle with the women, she undertook her punishment. For seven years, she was to sit beside the mountain block outside the city gates and to tell her story to all who came by and did not know it. She was also to offer to carry guests and travelers on her back to the court. And thus she spent part of the year. Hello! I'm Tairnon, and this is my mare. A beautiful animal, I'm sure you'll agree. That's right, that's There's only one problem. Every May Eve, she falls beautifully, but by evening, no sign of a cock. which is unusual. What are you going to do about it? It's May Eve tonight, I said. And may God strike me down there if I don't find out who's been stealing our fall. But beware, horsey! Ternon, Turo, Liant! Lord of Gwentiscoy is ready for you! Thank you. So it was done, and the boy was baptised and given the name Guri Wash Deirin, Guri of the Golden Hair. Fostered by Teirnon and his wife, he grew fast and strong. 
Meanwhile, Ternon heard the news of Rhiannon's punishment, and because of the way in which he had found the boy, he pondered on this. And it came to him that he had never seen a father and son so alike as Puil Penanum and this boy. When news came of the increasing wretchedness of Rhiannon's state, he could hold back no longer and went to his wife. Wife! Wife! We must take him to Lord Puig. And when will we get back to win that? Three things. Thanks for releasing Rhiannon from the punishment she suffers. Uh, thanks for fostering Puig's son and returning him to him. And if he'd be a gracious man, he will always look after us in time to come. And so they decided on that council. As they approached the city, they saw Rhiannon by the mountain block. Come, lady! Let us all go to the court Rhiannon together! Here is your son! Will anybody here deny that this is Point and Rhiannon's son? No! Yeah. 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 But I swear I did forget him. Frederi, it's caused his mother much anxiety. Frederi, son of Pulf Penanoven, shall be his name. Be not so hasty, Lord, lest his own name took him better. <laughs> what name is that? <laughs> Guri Wash Iron is the name we gave him. Guri of the Golden Hair. Frederi shall be his name. It is right that the boy should be so named. After the word his mother said when she heard the good news. Ternon. May God repay you and your wife for fostering the boy until this time. And now, if it pleases you, we shall give him to Pendaran Dillard to begin his learning. But I swear to God, while I live, I will support you and your possessions as long as I am able to support my own. Ac felly rhoddwyd y mab i ben daran dyfyd, a gwyrdaw wlad yr wyd gydag ef, a magwyd pryderu, fab pwyll pen anwfn, yn ofalus fel y dylid gwneud, fel y tyfodd y mab harddaf, a'r pen campwr gorau yn y deyrnas. Pryderu, son of pwyll, was brought up with loving care, so that he grew into the most handsome and gallant lad, and the most accomplished at every feat in the kingdom. Felly y treulu asant flynyddoedd a blynyddoedd, a daeth terfyn ar fywyd pwyll penanwfn, a bu farw. Thus they passed the years until Pwyll's life came to an end. Pryderi then ruled the seven cantrips of David, beloved by his country and all about him. And thus ends this branch of the Mabinogi. <laughs>